One of the most important principles in mechanics of materials, and in particular in uh, experimental mechanics, is that of St. Bernat's principle. And there's a related uh, topic called stress concentrations that we're going to look at in this video. Let's start out by just considering an axial loaded bar. So um, we've arbitrarily selected a 250 pound load and a cross section of one inch by a quarter of an inch. So our cross sectional area is a quarter of a square inch and our nominal axial stress, normal stress, P over A, is going to be a thousand PSI. Now what we'd like to consider is how do we actually apply that load to the ends? In the case of a tensile test of, of our Instron with our Instron tester, uh, we would grip the uh, bar on both ends. The uh, bottom grip is held stationary and the top grip is, which is attached to the cross head, will move up at a controlled rate. But we might ask is, um, would it be any different if we applied the load in a different way? For example, this bar could be um, a truss member and connected, uh, pin connected at the uh, end to a gusset plate or it could be some kind of a connecting rod. So maybe the 250 pounds is applied through a pin or a bolt uh, in contact with the, uh, with the whole surface. Several other ways, of course, that the load could be applied. Now, what St. Bernard's principle uh, says, it's, it's actually kind of uh, lengthy, but it has been uh, summarized by uh, Hibbler in his uh, Mechanics and Materials text, te textbook, excuse me, that the stress and strain produced at points in a body sufficiently removed from the region of load application will be the same as the stress and strain produced by any applied loadings as long as they have the same statically equivalent resultants and applied to the body with the same region. Okay, so simplify that a little bit. The method in which the load applied doesn't affect the stresses as long as you're a sufficient distance away from where the load's been applied. So we might ask ourselves, well, how far is a sufficient distance? And we can explore that a little bit with uh, some finite element analysis models. So. Let me switch over to SolidWorks and uh, we'll start out with our straight bar. Now all the lines here are just um, in SolidWorks what are known as split lines that actually just make these into different surfaces. But the purpose of those is just so that I can um, plot the stresses at different locations along through here. We're going to grip it on this uh, area right here, grip it on this area and apply the load um, axially or in the x-direction. So if we look at um, how the uh, loads are, excuse me, boundary conditions and loads are applied here, I've completely fixed this area right here and I've fixed this area from translating in the y and z directions but allow it to move in the x-directions and then apply the x-direction loading that you see, in here, that you see here um, for a total of 250 pounds. And I've already run this, but we'll just go ahead and show you, um, go ahead and create the finite element mesh. So you can see what the FEA does of dividing this uh, structure up into a lot of very small elements, uh, in this case triangular elements. And then we'll go ahead and run it and see it takes a very short amount of time. And what I've plotted here are the stresses in the x direction. Now I've also uh, changed the scale uh, from from high to low so that we can see it just to, uh, see the distributions around the load point a little better. And let's zoom in close to the load point. Um, you see that again the nominal stress is a thousand psi but uh, we can see that uh, at, at least one location we're up to 12, uh, almost 1200 PSI. And you can also see again the color differences in this area that the stress is not uniform in this area but does become uniform if I get further out. And in fact I can use something called the uh, probe tool and it lets me pick one of those lines that I showed you earlier, find the stresses at all the points along that line and make a quick little plot. And so you can see out here in the center of the specimen, 1000 PSI being our nominal stress, we only vary from that 
um, let's say four, four tenths of a PSI. So very, very small variation, again, just from numerical uh, uh, inaccuracies. But uh, certainly to the nearest PSI, we can say that 1,000 PSI consistently out here in the middle. Now what we want to see, of course, is how far away do we have to be before we get uh, a uniform distribution, or at least uh, approximately a uniform distribution. So let's go back, and now what I want to do is go, this is where the load supplied right here. So if I go a quarter inch away from it and show the plot, you can see that there's pretty good variation from 890 PSI at the edges to about 1,020 PSI in the middle, which you can also kind of pick up with the color uh, colors that you see here. If I go a little further out, instead of a half inch, let's go, excuse me, a quarter inch, let's go a half inch away. And so now it's a little better, uh, 900, say 940 some PSI up to about 1,025. So less of a variation, less of a difference from our nominal 1,000 PSI. I'll skip on to um, a full inch away. So there we were at, um, go back here, there's a quarter inch, half inch, three quarter inch, and a full inch away. And when I look at that plot, you can see the variation is from about 995 to uh, 1005 PSI. So a uh, very small uh, variation here. Uh, 10 PSI would be 1%, so uh, uh, much less than uh, a half of 1% variations when I get a full inch away from where the load is applied. Okay, but now let's look at the second loading possibility. And in this case, we model this by fixing this uh, this edge right here and applying the 250 pounds to this edge right here. So even though the arrows are shown a little differently there, but that is a uniformly uh, applied 250 pound load. And we've already run this, so I'm going to go ahead and just show the uh, uh, stress state. And I've used the same scale that we used uh, on the previous example, just for uh, comparison purposes. Uh, you can see actually the maximum value here is about 6600 PSI, so more than six times greater than our nominal P over A, but we would expect that uh, at the uh, uh, these locally high stresses right around where the stress is applied to the hole. We've also removed some material here, so we expect the stresses to be higher uh, for that reason. And this is an important um, uh, realization here of, of why St. Venant's principle is so important in experimental mechanics. What this is saying is that if I get far enough away from these localized stresses, it really doesn't matter how I apply the load. But now we're really trying to find out how far away do we need to be. In the last case, we saw if we were about a full inch away uh, from the uh, load application, in this case I'm going to say a full inch away from the hole, that uh, our variation was very, very low. So let's see if we can do the same thing here. I'm going to look at, first of all, let's go a quarter inch away. And you can see from the uh, colors here that we're going to have a lot of variation. And certainly that'll show up in the plot here. We're you know, almost 2,000 PSI down to uh, less than 500 PSI as we go across the um, uh, width here. And let's go all the way out. We won't uh, go to the half an inch or three quarters of an inch. Let's go all the way out to one inch again. Get those stresses and plot them up. And so now not so bad. We go from um, looks like about uh, 1015 PSI down to about 980. So the biggest difference from our nominal 1000 PSI is uh, about 20 PSI, so about 2%. So our rule of thumb seems to be pretty good, that if we're one inch away, our stresses are pretty much constant, in this case, uh, within about 2%.
Now, in either one of these cases, though, if we were trying to determine the strength of the uh, of the uh, whatever material we were testing, we would see that uh, we would be uh, failing this where the maximum stress occurs, which is going to be around where it is gripped. Uh, of course, to get a um, good value of uh, strength, I want this to fail uh, down in the zone away from all of these localized high stresses. So one way of doing that would be to thin out the bar toward the middle. So we're going back to our gripped configuration here. And we've uh, fixed this end, fixed this end, but allow it to move in the x direction and apply the 250 pounds. Now in the middle, I've cut the width in half, so half an inch. So our nominal stress will be 2,000 psi, so we should fail out in this region. Now when I look at the stress, though, you'll see that the maximum stress is not uh, still greater than 2,000 psi, still quite a bit higher, 2,800 psi, and the high stress occurs in uh, right at this sharp corner. That sharp corner is called a stress concentration. So where we have an abrupt change in geometry, um, we're going to have a high value of stress. Now, in this case, um, if we uh, tested this configuration, then we would expect that it would break right here. And again, our, our stress is not uh, just our P over A of 2,000 PSI. So we wouldn't get a very, uh, very good results out of this. We wouldn't get very repeatable results out of this uh, test configuration. So what we'll often do, and what's written into a lot of uh, uh, codes, ASTM uh, testing codes, is the geometry of what's known as a dog bone. And so the dog bone still does thin this out because you want to try to force the um, uh, failure out into the center. But uh, it does that without uh, any sharp uh, corners here and with a very nice gentle radius in these regions. So if I show the stresses for this one, you can see we still get a little bit greater than 2,000 PSI, but not much, only again about 2%. It's impossible to uh, get rid of that stress concentration completely, but uh, certainly we've smoothed it out to within a couple of percent. And remember, if we're testing a ductile material, one that stretches a good bit before failure, even if there's a slight uh, stress concentration, that we will get some local yielding, which will allow the stresses to redistribute to the area um, near it. And so we still should get failure um, out into this region, out into the uh, area of uh, constant stress. And if we make that area long enough, then uh, we can put a strain gauge uh, out in that uh, middle portion. We can put an extensometer over that middle portion, because as long as uh, we're far enough away, from any stress concentrations, then uh, our stress state can be assumed uh, to be constant within that region. So if we can kind of summarize what we've learned, we found that as long as two loadings are statically equivalent, then if we get far enough away from where the loading is applied, then we're going to have the same stress state and the same strain state for that matter. How far away do we need to be? General rule of thumb says that as, lo as long as we're far enough, as the distance that we're away from the uh, loading uh, point is equal to or greater than the largest dimension of the cross section. So in our case, we had a one inch by a quarter of an inch bar. And as long as we were one inch away from where the loading was applied, then our percent difference was very low. So rule of thumb, take the largest dimension of the cross section if you're that far away from the loading point, then you'll have a constant uh, state of stress. And also we found that if we have abrupt geometry change, then we get high stresses uh, right around the uh, geometry change, and those are called stress concentrations.